Hi, everyone. A quick comment before the episode starts. To keep making these episodes, we need your support. If you're listening on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel and share with your friends. Every subscription helps. If you're listening on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, or any other podcast platform, please give us a rating and leave a review. Your feedback is really important because it keeps us going. Thank you and enjoy today's episode. Dear beloved listener, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Before we begin, we have an offer for you. We just landed a $30 million contract to provide media services across all of Africa. But to get through the last stage, we need to put down an investment of $200,000. If you can help us secure this $30 million, we'll give you 10% commission. That's $3 million. If you can help with $200,000, reach out to us using our fax number and provide your personal phone number. Please treat this offer as most confidential as possible. Don't tell anyone. Hey everyone, we are absolutely kidding. Feel free to support us with donations, but there is no contract and no commission. Scams like the one you just heard John reenact for you, they are commonly called 419 scams. And they've been part of Nigeria's society for at least three decades. But now, these and other types of scams are getting dangerously close to becoming a cultural phenomenon. Today, Antonietta, John, and Nabila are going to walk you through how the 419 scam has evolved over the last three decades and where we may end up if we keep going down this road. About six weeks ago, 8th of February this year, a video surfaced on YouTube of a traffic jam along a votable Ekwawan Road in Benin City, the capital of Edo State. Several cars had stopped and people can be seen running into the road from all sides. They were rushing to pick up money that was literally falling from the sky. Well, the money was dropping from the sky but it was being thrown or sprayed into the air by three young men. At one point, one of the young men gets on top of the hood of a car and just throws a wad of money into the air. As drivers were trying to get through, more people rush into the street to collect and pocket the money. These young men fit the profile of what we in Nigeria call Yahoo Boys. Yahoo Boys are referred to as boys in Nigeria who take part in the cybercrime known as Yahoo Yahoo. Now, every country has its own list of notorious cons and con artists. The U.S. gave us Charles Ponzi and the Ponzi scheme in the 1920s. It's the classic pyramid scheme where Ponzi promised investors a significant return, 50%, sometimes even 100%. And he was able to deliver this by simply shuffling money from one person to the next. It was the financial scandal of the century. One of the most respected figures on Wall Street, a man who was considered to have the investment Midas touch, had not actually invested a dime in the The Ponzi scheme has been reintroduced in many forms, most recently and notoriously by Bernie Madoff in 2008. Jezdi Horohorin, the Israeli-Russian credit card hacker of 2009. Then there was Dr. Conti, the Indonesian male fraudster star of 2012, who basically sold inexpensive wines but relabeled them as expensive brands like Bordeaux. And the list goes on and on. Around the 1980s, Nigeria entered the global scam market with our very own brand. The Nigerian Prince. The Nigerian Prince is an advanced fee scam that went global during the 1980s. The scam starts when you receive a letter. 
It used to be postal mail and then gradually became email. Dear beloved, he writes, I am a royal prince coming to you with an incredible investment opportunity. Mr. Sir, did you know you have millions of dollars unclaimed in a Western Union account? I can help you get it out. All you need is a small cash advance or a bank account number to complete the wire transfer. Then these unexpected riches are yours. Wait, that's it? That's the scam? Yes, very simple. Promise the victim a significant share of a large sum of money in return for a small upfront payment. If a victim makes the payment, the fraudster will simply disappear. And the people fall for this. This type of crime eventually, in the 1990s, became known as 419. 419 is a section in Nigeria's criminal code that states, any person who by any false pretense and with intent to defraud obtains from any other person anything capable of being stolen or induces any other person to deliver to any person anything capable of being stolen is guilty of a felony and is liable to imprisonment for three years. Three doesn't seem that long, so over the years, as this type of crime has grown, we've seen the country pass several more laws that are a lot more harsh. For example, the Advance Fee Fraud and Other Fraud-Related Offenses Act of 2006 says offenders can get between 7 to 20 years in prison. But this hasn't really stopped the fraud industry from thriving. And the criminals are constantly evolving and changing their tactics. For example, they upgraded from the Nigerian prince to Yahoo! The Yahoo Yahoo scam. Yahoo Messenger was launched on January 7th, 1997. And at the time, it was the coolest instant messaging client in the world. It was the Facebook and the Twitter of that era. Yahoo Messenger was a fun way of chatting with your friends and meeting new people on the internet. So it became a gateway for young Nigerians to reach people in other parts of the world. Now remember, at this time, the mobile technology at the time was the laptop. But laptops had not reached Nigeria yet. Instead, we had internet cafes. According to Pulse Niger, internet cafes started popping up all around Nigeria in 1999. This is also the year when Nigeria transitioned from military rule to a civilian government. Under Abacha's military rule, Nigeria fell behind in our development and as the world marched towards a new age ruled by the internet, the country was stuck in the past. So when the internet and the internet cafes came along, this was huge. It gave us a window into the outside world. Before, we were restricted to videotapes of Hollywood and Nollywood movies and foreign rap videos played on African independent television, AIT. We now had the internet. And with 100 naira per hour, we could go around the globe, one chat room at a time. The Yahoo chat rooms were public and separated into different interests, hobbies, and likes. You could choose from hundreds of rooms. And if you wanted to take conversations away from the public chat rooms, you could hit someone up directly through DMs. You could meet random people from different parts of the world. New York, Spain, France, London, I mean everywhere. All you had to do was create an ID and you were good to go. So with this new advancement, the scam business upgraded. No more postal letters or mails. And with access to the world, the market for targets and potential victims boomed overnight. And there was one particular group that Nigerian Yahoo scams targeted. Lonely and single women, usually older women. Remember, at this time, the demographic in the West is changing. For example, the marital rate in the United States has been steadily declining since 1990. In 1999, it was 8.6 per 1,000, and by 2010, the marital rate had dropped to about 6.8 per 1,000. Another thing is, in some parts of the world, loneliness is increasing. So you've got parts of the world that have a growing need for companionship, and then you have Nigeria. Back then, we had an actually still have a booming population of young men. In the 1990s to 2000, 
On average, 20% of our population was around 15 to 24 years old, single and willing to mingle. Oh, and also unemployed. At this time, the Nigerian economy is tanking. This is because industrialized economies like Europe and North America were going through a recession in the early 1980s. This recession led to a fall in demand for exports coming from developing countries like Nigeria, which continued to impact us through the 1990s. Problem was, and still is, that Nigeria's economy is dependent on exporting crude oil. So as oil prices fell, unemployment rates were rising. So you mix these three things together, unemployment, the internet, and lonely single women abroad, and you get... The Romance Scam. The Romance Scam involves dating vulnerable and gullible women abroad that are relatively wealthy and single for financial gains and other benefits. In our research, we came across this interview done by Zuma magazine in 2018. They interviewed Okechuku Nandi, a Yahoo boy who says he fishes for different women around the world before picking his target. The target is usually middle-aged, lonely female whom he has no chance of actually ever meeting. So he starts chatting, promising her love and happiness. According to him, this takes a lot of time because trust needs to be created. And after some time, he introduces her to his mother. Wait, John, is his mother part of the scam? Not exactly. The introduction is through the phone. He changes his voice. The Technophone has a voice changer app that he uses to change his voice so that he can sound like an elderly woman. The voice will tell her, He has been telling me all about you. God will bless your union with my son. I can't wait to meet you and to welcome you into the family as my daughter. After this call, the target now trusts him even more. Then after some time, he tells her that his mother is sick and needs a huge amount for surgery or something which the target will gladly provide. At this point, he either continues the scam or he disappears. The romance scam continued through the mid-2000s. And remember, all of this is happening in internet cafes. Mobile technology had not taken off yet. Since cyber cafes usually operated for 24 hours, cyber criminals could work as long as they wished. The success of the early pioneers of this operation led to more people joining, and soon, Nigeria's reputation was synonymous with internet fraud. This embarrassed the Nigerian government, which led to attempts to clamp down. The government raided cyber cafes, closing down the ones that were not properly registered, and arresting those who were engaging in online fraud. The government also created sanctions aimed at limiting or at least discouraging the operations of Yahoo Boys. And between 2006 and 2009, we did see a decrease in internet fraud activity. But then China came along, and with China came... Cheaper mobile technology. Technophones flooded our market. HP laptops also came along at affordable prices. At the same time, data providers also found the Nigerian market. Mobile technology and internet service providers breathed new life into Yahoo Yahoo, and we haven't turned back since. Since 2010, Yahoo scams have gone through several upgrades, and as target victims get smarter, Yahoo boys change their tactics. They're still doing their romance scams, but added more sophisticated scams to their portfolio. According to Okechuku's interview with Zuma magazine, the investment scams involve creating fake businesses with fake papers and documents. The scammers approach their victims and try to convince them to invest, which is harder than the romance scams. Because they actually have to get the business started or make it look like it started. They will create fake receipts, photo IDs, name of agents, business terms, and anything needed to appear real and legit. And the other thing with the investment scams is that they require international collaboration. So let's say you set up a fake business here in Nigeria and you have convinced someone abroad to invest. They need a place to transfer that money. You would then find someone abroad, 
usually a Nigerian in the diaspora, and have them set up an account to collect the money. Now, just to be clear, Nigerians living and working abroad have a solid reputation for contributing to their host communities. There is Philip Emeguali, who designed the software for the fastest computer on earth, Elizabeth Bright, the 22-year-old UK-based Nigerian student who made history after being elected as councillor in the United Kingdom. Tony Iwobi, the first Nigerian to be elected as the first black senator in Italy. But just like all national groups, a small number of Nigerians abroad find their way into crime. Federal investigators are searching for suspects in an internet fraud case that nearly anyone who's received a suspicious email will recognize. These six fugitives are thought to be in the U.S. 80 people in all, most of them from Nigeria, face charges after a three-year investigation. In 2019, the FBI charged 80 people for participating in online scams, stealing more than $40 million from people in the U.S. and abroad. That's the equivalent of about 15 billion naira. The FBI's investigation found that 77 of those people are Nigerians living in the U.S. and Nigeria. But not all scams are against foreigners. Yes, even Nigerians will fall for 419 scams. According to Okechuku, it is difficult to convince in Nigeria about the investment scam, but some women in Nigeria still fall for the romance scam. But the story he uses to scam local Nigerian women is a bit different. He finds his first victim, usually a middle-class woman. He finds a picture of a handsome man to use as his profile, and he starts chatting with her. He tells her that he's in Abuja, but after a while, he tells her that he has to take a business trip to the US, and he will keep in touch from there. So before he takes this pretend trip, he will send her a high-quality phone. So, for example, if she currently has an iPhone 5, he will upgrade her to an iPhone 8. When she gets this type of gift from him, she is now convinced that their relationship is real. The next phase is to then call the victim from abroad. Someone, probably an international collaborator, will call the phone call so it appears to be originating from the US or whichever country he says he's traveling to. Once she's convinced that he is really in the United States, he tells her that his mom has fallen ill and urgently needs 350,000 for surgery. That's about 1,000 US dollars. He would then send someone who poses as a younger brother to her to explain everything and get the money. He sometimes goes himself and poses as the younger brother. This face-to-face -face reassures the victim that the money will be repaid as soon as he returns. Of course, the money is not returned to the victim, and she may never hear from the scammer ever again. Well, yeah, the scammers have what they want, money. That's right, and they do the next thing. They block traffic and spray the money, or they spend it on lavish items like cars, phones, jewelry, wine, champagne. One guy spent 5 million naira on champagne, an ace of spades and Don Perignon, in one club in one night. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, John and Anthony. It's a, Nabila, this activity, Yahoo Yahoo, we heard about how we got here and even a little bit about why it exists. Tell us, where is it taking us to? So there's actually a real danger that we're starting to make Yahoo Yahoo part of our culture. When we think of culture, we think of language, symbols, rituals, value, and norms. And we know that cultures change over time. Some things that are in our culture now will drop out in 50 to 100 years as we adapt to new pressures and we pick up new behaviors that eventually become part of our culture. In a paper by two scientists, Krober and Parsons, back in 1958, certain elements were identified as what makes something cultural. First, for something to become a culture, it must be of value. That is, it has to solve a problem. So, for example, in Cameroon, there's a tradition of breast ironing. When a girl hits puberty, her mother will press or massage her breasts using stones, spatulas, and in some cases, even a pestle to flatten her breasts. Now, in that community, it actually reduced unwanted attention from men and incidences of rape. 
The second thing for something to become cultural is that it must translate into individual behavior, which is then passed down to other members of that community. Culture is dependent on repetitive behavior, which tends to begin with one individual and is passed on to other members. The third is that as the behavior is passed down, it gains widespread acceptance based on value and repetition. Now, over time, breast ironing has been passed down from family to family, generation to generation. And according to Africa Health Organization, 25 to 50 percent of girls in Cameroon are affected by breast ironing. As the behavior is repeated by more and more people, it becomes automatic, cemented as culture, to the point where people are not really aware that they are even doing it. Okay, so Nabila, I get why breast ironing became a culture. It served a purpose, a protective purpose almost. Um, but Yahoo Yahoo, what problem is that behavior solving? The end goal of Yahoo Yahoo is to rob another person of their money and make it your own. But let's be very clear, money is the end goal for Yahoo Yahoo. Remember that for something to become a culture, it has to have value. It has to solve some problem. Now, in 2013, in a thesis by Andreas Doppelmayr, he interviewed four Yahoo boys, and they claimed that having money allows them to solve problems like paying for school, supporting their family, living up to family expectations, and just having something to do. Okay, but Nabila, what problems are these boys solving when they buy expensive cars, champagne for five million naira, and spray money on the streets? I think in these guys' minds, doing those things solves the problem of relevance. They want to be recognized as having made it. And the pressure to make it is high on some of these guys. In Doppelmayr's research, one informant had this to say, and I quote, Parents pressure. You know, some parents will call you. Look, look at your friend that you went to secondary school together. He just bought a new car for his mom, his mother. You, my son, what are you doing? What are you using your head to do? Are you not a man? I'm getting old. When am I going to reap the fruit of my labor? Go and find something to do. Ah, mommy, that guy, he's doing shady things now. Things that are no good. See, eh? Just, I'm not saying you should do bad things, oh. But go and make a fortune indirectly, you know? Now, it sounds hilarious, but... For those in Yahoo Yahoo, they've managed to convince themselves that there is some kind of underlying problem they are solving. Usually, it is tied to the problem of family and community expectations. Someone in the family has to make it. Someone has to come back and support the community by any means necessary. Keep in mind, these guys know what they're doing is wrong, but they need to rationalize it, and this is one of the ways they do it. Okay, so we have a behavior that is of value to them. And to their communities. And to their communities. How does this behavior now get passed down to other members of the community? That's easy. Once young people observe a behavior and its consequences, they imitate. In a 2019 study by Samuel Adedra and his colleagues, they found that Yahoo Yahoo is learned by young people from just regular interactions with cyber criminals in their neighborhoods, their schools, cup houses, and even social gatherings. The Yahoo boys live a lavish and very loud lifestyle. They don't hide. And this usually serves as an incentive to recruit more young people into the Yahoo life. Now... Nabila, the EFCC, that's the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, they've been cracking down on Yahoo recently. That's right. And the new EFCC boss, Abdul Rashid Bauer, stated that they recently arrested about 300 cyber criminals across the country in just the last month. But the problem is that the positive associations of Yahoo Yahoo still outweigh the negatives, especially in the minds of the young I mean, you've said it yourself several times. The young do not have developed prefrontal cortexes. They have underdeveloped consciences. They feel like they are invincible. 
And then you add on top of that the third element. The behavior has and is gaining acceptance in parts of our society. In the same paper by Adedra and his colleagues, they noted that there have been several cases where popular Yahoo boys are given chieftaincy titles and are even asked to contribute towards community development projects. Even if they don't get outright validation, the cone of silence around their behavior serves as validation to them. They bring home millions, three, four, five brand new cars, and no one asks them anything about how they made that money. And everyone is happy to chop that money. I mean, you heard Antonietta telling you about the people who were rushing into the streets to collect money that was being sprayed by young men, allegedly Yahoo boys. Yahoo Yahoo boys have been known to provide financial security for their families and communities. And as long as their actions do not negatively impact or harm their communities, they're more likely to gain acceptance, which brings us to the last element of how a behavior becomes a culture. The behavior becomes automatic. It's actually expected. Right now, we're not there yet. Interestingly, and rather sadly, there was a disturbing video that surfaced on February 12th, only four days after the one we talked about in the beginning. In this video, you can see primary school age kids this is happening live at Ubeku Primary School here in Upper Sakomba. You can see the children blocking the blocking the buses passing by. You can see. You can see what our country is turning into. Apparently, the kids had blocked the buses passing by and were spraying paper, basically imitating what the young men had done a few days before. You can see with your eyes. You can see. You can see them everywhere. Look at what the leaders of tomorrow in Nigeria are doing. You can see that. You can see them. Children just closing from school. You can see them splitting paper everywhere. The Backstory is brought to you by Triple E Media Productions, production copyright 2021, Triple E Media Productions. If you enjoyed this episode of The Backstory and want to hear more, subscribe to our 234 Audio YouTube channel. Episodes of this podcast can also be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of The Backstory was produced by... John Iwodi, Antonietta Kalunta, Nabila Usman, Nico Rivers, Dominic Tabakaji, and Sam Tabakaji. Special thanks to Rabia Hadeja, Richard Anyabe, Alexandra Gekpe, Stanley Bentu, Aredi Isha, and Mala Iwa Bado Ikaleku. I'm Ramat Mohammed. See you next week.